The Dead Zone may sound like the title of a 1950s horror movie, but it actually describes a real-life ecological horror, a part of the ocean with so little oxygen that animals can't live there and are forced to flee or die. Dead zones are a natural fact of life from time to time along coasts all over the world, but are becoming more widespread because of human impact. There are now 400 dead zones worldwide, with the count doubling every decade. Most of these form in coastal waters, where rivers dump loads of pollutants into the oceans, such as in the Gulf of Mexico. But a different and more mysterious type of dead zone has been drawing attention recently, a kind that forms out in open ocean water. One of these dead zones is located in the Pacific Northwest. And scientists are beginning to think the increase in these dead zones trace back to humans, too. Not through the dumping of chemicals, but through the long-term effects of climate change. Jack Barth at Oregon State University is one researcher investigating climate change's role in these chronic coastal die-offs. He says scientists first noticed them in 2002. By 2004, they were obvious even to everyday beachgoers. We received these photographs of, you know, literally ankle or knee-deep piles of Dungeness crabs up in the inner tidal. Very unusual. Other pictures showed crabs littering the beaches where the uh, seagulls were, were feeding merrily. Two years later, the team found things had gotten even worse. In the summer 2006, uh, for the first time ever, we saw the oxygen levels go to zero. When we went down with a remotely operated vehicle with a camera on board, we saw no fish. Much of the marine life on the seafloor was dead. We could actually see uh, some dead worms kind of blowing in the currents down on the seafloor. So what's causing these zones to expand? To answer that question, you need a broad, continuous view under the sea surface, which traditional devices like buoys and shipboard sampling aren't really designed for. So Barth and his team are taking a different approach, sending underwater robotic gliders into affected areas. A single glider can venture out to sea for up to three weeks at a time, sending back constant measurements on the state of the ocean. What the gliders do is they give us that view underneath the sea surface in near real time. I get the data right back to my computer on my desk every six hours, and I can kind of keep my finger on the pulse of the ocean. The gliders have definite advantages over human crews, Barth says. They don't get seasick. Which is actually a pretty big perk. Traditional instruments have to be deployed by ships and crews, which is costly and challenging, and then they only operate for a brief time. Gliders, on the other hand, are nearly autonomous once they're deployed, and they can provide data over large spans of space and time, which is key to teasing out the effects of a complex problem such as climate change. So what has the research found? Well, Oregon's expanding dead zones are probably being caused by decreased oxygen in deeper waters, as well as changes in wind patterns, which bring more nutrients up from the deep ocean. Algal blooms spring up, then decay, and the bacteria that feeds on them deplete the water of oxygen. If this low oxygen water is not efficiently flushed away from the coast, dead zones may appear. That much is pretty clear, but what's behind the changed wind patterns? Barth and other researchers suspect it's climate change. But to see climate change requires looking over a long span of time, which is just what gliders allow researchers to do. The data they'll provide will help diagnose the cause of Oregon's dead zones, and that's a task that will only become more urgent in the years ahead. I think definitely that every year now, every summer, we should expect to see these low oxygen areas. The real question is how big will they be, how long will they last, and just how low will the oxygen levels go? For the National Science Foundation, I'm Kevin Norris.